anyway, welcome to my lair. <laughs> you are John Law. You are uh, a neon sign technician. I believe you were a member of the San Francisco Suicide Club, mm -hmm. which was not about committing suicide for context, but it, <laughs> not was, for most of us. <laughs> it was about living every day as if it was your last, kind essentially. Of, yeah. um, okay. And I believe you're also one of the co-founders of Burning Man. I am a uh, stand accused. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, no worries. Um, so let's lead with the central question of urban exploring, which is why do it? Why do urban exploring? Um, uh, well, f for me, yeah, I've been exploring stuff. I'm just curious about things and about environments. And I've been exploring stuff since I was a little kid. Um, and I actually, I think most people are natural explorers. I think they start out as natural explorers and they start out as, as uh, sort of uh, natural, uh, creative people and they start out as uh, you know, compassionate and able to interconnect with other people and it's beaten out of them by the time they're about eight years old, usually sometimes even sooner. So and some people hang on to certain aspects of that creative desire and maybe go into a particular direction and follow it. But for me, I just like, I was like a little kid and I liked exploring things. and. Fortunately, when I grew up, my, our parent, I grew up in a period of time when the parents, you know, it's just like you're out of the house and they expected you back by, you know, when you're younger by, da by dark and when you're a little bit older by 10 o'clock or whatever, then and no control over what you're doing the rest of the time and not that much interest. And so, you know, I was pretty free and I grew up in a small town on a river, so I did a lot of exploring of the woods and a lot of climbing trees and stuff like that. and. Um, and I just liked exploring things. Um, and in the little town that I lived in, there were some storm tunnels, which were, I started going into when I was like six and uh, seven years old, and because they were pretty close to our house, and uh, and um, just kept going into those. And uh, actually, as I got older, I mean, I had some experiences in storm tunnels. I got chased by the cops one time, and literally ran into the storm tunnels, and I got away. They didn't follow me, and so you know, it's like that was. That was later. I was 17 when that happened. 16, uh, 16. I was going to ask, you got chased by the cops when no, you were 8 when years I was, old. I was 16. <laughs> and just the fact that they did, they wouldn't follow me in there, that helped me even like the tunnels better. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, okay. It's kind of like a magic kingdom where you're safe. Yeah. And I didn't conceptualize that at the time, but I internalized it, I suppose. And uh, so there's all these positive experiences about exploring that I had when I was young. And there are other kids that like to do it and were into it, but I was really, you know, I mean, I like climbing things a lot. And I, I mentioned this to Mo Gates, and it's in his book, uh, that when I was really, when I was five years old, I used to climb the swing set, uh, uh, you know, back then. They, back then they had great swing sets that were like really, really tall, and you could swing way the fuck out, and kids would like swing up to the end of the arc of the of the uh, swing seat and then jump off of it, you know, like 15 feet through the air, which you can't do. I mean. This nanny state bullshit where they don't want kids to do anything like challenging whatsoever, which destroys their spirit really. And you know you have to take risks and occasionally like break your arm, you know. And so, but we could do that. So this uh, this uh, swing set, you know, I used to climb it a lot when I was five years old. I could climb all the way to the top of the pipe. It was probably about 15 feet, you know, or maybe 20 feet at the most, something like that. It's not that high, but you know, for like a five-year-old kid, it might as well be Mount Everest. And so the accomplishment of climbing it was awesome. And then I would, I would slide down it, and I would wrap my legs around it and slide down it, and I got a tingle in my crotch. So it was my first, my first, it was my first experience with that, with sex, basically. And, uh, and so it's very, it has a very, it had a very positive, uh, you know, like a, a, a you know, for, formative influence on my psyche, let's put it that way. So I just kind of identified climbing with good feelings and, Climbing and you know, and then exploring also with, with these good feelings, and so uh, that's kind of you know. And so I just always like to explore things. It was always something I would do just by myself, or if somebody would do it with me, that'd be great. And then when I moved to San Francisco when I was 17, I got in all this trouble. Long story short, I got in all this trouble when I was a teenager. We moved from Michigan to Tennessee, and I was in Tennessee for a year. And Tennessee was a the town I was in was a, was basically a a, a, a redneck gangster town, like serious crime gangster town, like just white trash. It's a great town in a lot of ways, but it's not a really heavy criminal element. And moving from a small town in, in Michigan where all, 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 all of the criminal kids were just smoking weed and running around the woods, sneaking into cabins, right? We didn't do anything that terrible, right? 
But I moved to Tennessee, and the kids my age were breaking into houses, stealing all their shit, stealing cars, running them into trees and stuff like that. So that's what I started doing. And it was really exciting. And there are a lot of reasons why I got into that. I'm not making excuses for it. I mean, if somebody shot me in the head while breaking into their house when I was 16, I would have deserved it. But with that said, you know, there are reasons why I was doing it, and uh, mostly for excitement. And uh, I wasn't really, didn't care about getting money from stealing shit from people or anything like that, or didn't, wasn't interested in hurting people necessarily. I didn't even think about it until later, and then I didn't realize how horrible what we were doing was, how awful it was. <coughs> but um, that came to, uh, you know, I mean, I came to realize that later, and I'm very sorry for what being involved in that shit. But with that said, I mean, it was really exciting. Stealing a car and driving around in it and driving in a tree is really exciting. You know, it's really fun. And, uh, yeah, real rush. And so when I got out of there and I got away from that whole horrible scene and ended up, I ended up hitchhiking to California, I ran away from home and uh, skipped juvenile probation in, John, in, in, in Tennessee, in the town I was in in Tennessee, went back to Michigan for about a month where I hung out with my buddies who I'd grown up with from, from uh, childhood, from like the time I was six. And then after a couple months there, left with a friend and we hitchhiked cross country uh, in June, May, June. I think we left in May of uh, 76. And I got to San Francisco in 76, May, June of 76. And for the first year, I had one friend here and I just, I totally didn't want to be a criminal. I caught doing all that shit. I stopped drinking. I stopped doing drugs, and I couldn't stop smoking cigarettes, unfortunately, because I kept doing that. But I just wanted, to, didn't want to do that anymore. I wanted to like, be, you know, like not be a criminal. And I had one older friend here who was a good mentor, uh, uh, you know, um, Ron Unger. And uh, long story short, I ended up staying here. And he kept trying to get me involved in stuff that he was involved in. And he was involved in a thing called Communiversity, which was a free school part of San Francisco State. It was just a really cool organization where they had free classes, anybody could teach them, anybody could come, you didn't pay any money for it. It was basically, it was way more of a social exchange than an actual educational organ, let's put it that way. And uh, and so he, I ended up, uh, I was kind of vaguely interested in it, but it didn't, I didn't get involved. And I was out, out spending a lot of time by myself, and I, I just loved the city so much. I loved the urban environment so much. It's like, I always wanted to go to a city. I grew up in a small town in Michigan. And we traveled a lot, but my, my dad, my dad was a college professor, and uh, so we'd take the summers off and travel, but he was an outdoorsman. And we would go to Alaska, we'd go to, you know, state par or national parks in the, you know, in, the, in, the, in the Rockies, we'd go up to northern Michigan, Upper Peninsula, and go camping and fishing, which is great, I like that, but I wanted to go to cities really bad, and Pop hated cities. Like we'd be driving cross country, and we'd be going by Chicago, and go, Pop, will you please drive through Chicago? And like, he'd go around it. He just hated cities. New York City, we went up to New England one time and I begged him, please drive through. I just want to see the skyscrapers. And he said, nope, bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so when I was, all I wanted to do was be in a city because I loved the fucking urban environment and the stories and the intensity and the lights and the noise, I loved it. And so going to, uh, it was either like New York or San Francisco, pretty much. And San Francisco had reasons for wanting to go to San Francisco, so when I, was in trouble in Tennessee and I bailed out and I ended up coming to San Francisco. And all I did was all I did was walk. I fucking walked. Like I finally got, got a couple jobs. Long story short, I, I slept in the park for a while, then I got a job sweeping up a youth hostel. Then I got a job at Macy's department store of all places. Worked there for about nine months and then I kinda got settled in, got an apartment. All I did was walk. I walk in any neighborhood in San Francisco at that time, like most urban city, cities was in a massive criminal uproar. It was it was really dangerous on the streets, like stupid dangerous. And uh, I mean, if you watch like the movie Taxi Driver, set in like 75 in New York, that's exactly how it was. You know, or uh, the TV show uh, The Deuce, if you ever saw that. It's like New York City, it was New York, but it, it was just really, really dangerous on the streets. Way more dangerous than it is now. And, uh, but I was like, you know, 19 years old, set 18, 19, 20 years old, and. You know, I could run really fast, so I didn't, you know, but, and I would go, I'd walk in any neighborhood, I'd wear like a ratty coat, I'd walk in any neighborhood, and uh, I hiked and explored everything, and I just loved it, and then finally Ron, my older buddy Ron, was, he was a little worried about me, because I hadn't really made that many friends, and so he kind of kept trying to hook me up with this community university thing, and then the, 
people, some of the people in the community university did an event called, called the Suicide Club, which they posted in the com community university calendar, uh, the cla calendar of classes. They listed the class, and I read the write-up for it, and I just started laughing. It was like what I wanted to do. What they were describing was short, but what they were describing was what I wanted to do more than anything else. And uh, they said they're going to explore. They were going to explore storm tunnels, or we're going to go watch. They were going to go like to big storm fronts on the on the on the uh, waterfront and watch the waves crash on the ocean. They're going to they're going to uh, do you know like uh, street theater. They're going to infiltrate Nazi bars. They're going to all this shit they're describing is like sounded amazing. It's like really adventurous. And I joined. I joined for the first initiation, and I for the next five years, all I did was 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 create events with these people in the Suicide Club. And the great thing about it is, well, it it had it had an outlet for me, of total adventure and excitement because the stuff we were doing, a lot of it, not all of it, but a lot of it we weren't supposed to do. Uh, a lot of it was kind of dangerous. We climbed bridges, you know, Golden Gate Bridge, the Bay Bridge, Richmond San Rafael Bridge. We went into storm tunnels. We did, you know, street theater. They call it LARPing, uh, uh, LARPing now, uh, li live action role playing games in weird places. We did street theater. We'd go and infiltrate weird cults, you know, just to pretend that we wanted to join them. You know, we'd have like you know, pie fights on the street. I mean, I got naked on the cable cars. Any idea anybody could come up with, any idea anybody could come up, we'd make an event out of. The thing that was different about the Suicide Club and was <coughs> profound and affected me more than anything else in my life ever and it stuck with me and it's co completely guided my, whatever you want to call it, path or career, whatever the fuck it is, uh, is that they were extremely moral and ethical about what they were doing. So if we went into we the, the whole leave no trace concept. I mean, we didn't invent it, but it was solid in the Suicide Club. Like if we went into even abandoned buildings, we wouldn't trash them. We didn't do any tagging. Nothing gets taggered, but we didn't do any tagging. We didn't do any any vandalism. We didn't do anything like that. And it was by philosophical. It was a philosophical concept. It's like we're using this space. We don't own it, so we're borrowing it, and we're going to leave it exactly how we found it, and nobody will know that we were there. And it was a very profound tenet of the of the group. That was one. Also, uh, Gary Warren, who was kind of the primary sort of the philosophical theoretician or avatar, whatever you want to call it. I mean, it was a it was a collaborative group, and there were a lot of creative people involved involved in it. But I would have to say Gary probably came up with much of the philosophy behind what we were doing, and uh, and he believed that uh, we were all in a game, and like any game there were rules and or in order to play the game fairly and honestly you would figure out what the game was and play it and play it that way and not be an asshole and so to him it's like when you're out doing something you're not supposed to do with a group of people don't trash things don't be an asshole don't fucking you know don't terrorize little kids or anything like that but do what you want to do and realize that everybody else is in the game they just don't know it so like the police are part of the game too so if you're doing something you're not supposed to do and you encounter the police it's like they're not your enemy. They're just, you know, the, the, they're the other team in the game, and you have to be smarter than them, and not an asshole, and not be afraid of them, or not be afraid of them, or lie to them. And that was how he looked at the world. And so I adopted that pretty, t pretty totally. And my philosophy around doing urban exploring and adventuring and doing events and creating tableaus ever since then has been, uh, you know, don't lie about what you're doing, you know. Uh, uh, treat people, you know, don't be an asshole, don't trash people's shit, don't judge other people like, oh, we're cooler than you because we're, we know how to sneak in the Golden Gate Bridge or whatever. And I'm very, very, very much a believer in that. Just don't be a, in a basic tenet, don't be a dick when you're doing stuff like this. And people, get, you know, when they get in groups and they have a little bit of power, they have a tendency to go a little bit too far sometimes. So we kind of try to keep an eye on that and, and be aware of that and mitigate that natural human tendency by having these agreements about what we were doing. And so in the Suicide Club, you know, the most dangerous stuff we did, some of it was like climbing bridges, you know, we did hop freight trains, we did, I did a hop freight train hopping class one time, I'll forget <laughs> that, that was pretty funny. And, uh, and so the idea was that people were, people were taking risks that normal people in normal situations might not, not normal people, but, but average folks like we were, but in average situations wouldn't take, or wouldn't even think of taking. And so when you're doing that, you have to, the people that you're working with, you have to agree with them about certain things. And, you, and, and, and if you can't agree on certain tenets, then you shouldn't be doing the event. So, and Gary Devine and Gadrian Burke and some other people devised this really clever mechanism to drive that. And that was, uh, for the Suicide Club, it became kind of a formalized group, sort of. It had very few mechanisms that were formal. One of the only ones was the fact it was a monthly newsletter. 
And uh, for the monthly newsletter, anybody can list an event. Anybody. It could be any event they wanted to. Where there's no control. The people who control the uh, the people who are editing the newsletter that month couldn't say they couldn't be in the newsletter. They'd have to post it. Uh, and then the editorship of the newsletter rotated every month, so no one person controlled the newsletter. Okay, because that was the only real mechanism of control in the group. There was a treasurer who, because he'd spend in fifty cents for postage, which is enough for postage for. 12 months, right? Uh, and you send in 50 cents, so, so there's a person who had to like control this tiny amount of money that was needed to like mail out the uh, mail out the newsletters. And we would meet together and make the newsletters every month. We'd like we'd get reams of paper out of dumpsters from offices downtown, print on the back sides of them. You'll see if you look at the newsletters. And we would uh, we would have a, a mailing party and put it together and and put them together that way. So it's very cheap, very low budget. We didn't have any money. We were totally broke. And then, so the, the treasurer rotated every four months. So nobody, there wasn't even anybody controlling the tiny amount of money there was. And the mechanism we put in place for a reason, is because Gary and Adrian and some of the other organizers, you know, initiators of the suicide club, did not want anybody to run it. They wanted it to be a collaborative effort, where it was a like a mind, like a like a group mind zeitgeist kind of scenario, where you're tuned into what's happening in the world at the time, but it's also like a group mind. And it works better than any other organization or any other experiment I've been involved in in the last 45 years. It worked really well for a short period of time. Because the other, the other trick to all this shit was that everything's temporary and realizing it's temporary and then not, not keeping a death grip on any kind of an edifice that you've created through your collaborative work with other people that accru accrues power because it becomes a thing and then people are like, oh, you're in the suicide cycle, that's really cool. You know, or you're Burning Man, that's really cool. You, it, it accumulates this top-down hierarchical kind of structure that then just ends up destroying the spe original spirit completely. It does it every time I've watched it. And with the Suicide Club, they had a mechanism in place that kind of countered that, which is nobody controlled it, right? And, uh, and it worked really well for about five years. Uh, and, then, uh, and then even then, human dynamics kind of instincts don't go on forever. You have to like, let go of them. And, and realizing that is a very difficult thing, but because that group was so amazing and so intense, I had such a great time. Um, but uh, when it ended, I was crushed because I thought, you know, well, we'll never do anything like that again. It's just over. And I was pretty wrong about that, but I didn't know it. I was only 23, 20, 23 to 25. I was 23 when the Suicide Club ended, 25 when Gary Warren died, which was a huge blow. It was a terrible blow. And, uh, and then uh, it took me several years to kind of get over that. And then we started the Cacophony Society with a group of people over in the Suicide Club. It was kind of a kinder, gentler Suicide Club. But, to get into urban exploring, which is your interest, um, your main interest, uh, Golden Gate Bridge. So, looking at the urban environment as a playground was part of the philosophy. And I don't know that Gary was a. I don't know if he was aware of the situationist uh, psychogeography theories at that time or not. He may have been, but we never talked about it. But we did talk about certain things. He was. He was very influenced by Dada. So this is why I don't think he was familiar with the. Uh, psychogeography theory at the time because he was very interested in Dada and he felt like Dada was an influence on what he was wanting to do which there's a lot I mean there's a lot to that and, and a lot to unpack there but uh, 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 but with that said the general tenet of the suicide club the general tenor of the suicide club was not that we were some philosophical experiment it was a literal living in the world experiment you know and uh, since that time, I've gotten to know a lot of, to be to make a make a joke. I've, I, I've gotten to know a lot of French people and a lot of French uh, 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 um, philosophically inclined French people who like theorize a lot about stuff. And some of them still do think. I've known some really good you know urban explorers who are French guys and gals. But uh, with that said, the, the cliche is they're sitting around the, you know they're little beret smoking Galois and talking about shit all the time and so my and they came up with a situation series that was a French French philosophy that kind of evolved or devolved devolved really out of uh, out of uh, 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 existentialism and, and earlier Rousseauian kind of tenets and uh, and so that and there are lots there's a lot to be said about that but what we were doing in America wasn't as philosophically based at all it was more like uh, you know with the, with the French 
<laughs> you know, the French situation is some deconstructionists. You'd have the society of the spectacle, and I like to say it's like in the states, it's more like the society of the testicle. We just like fucking do it. We don't think too much. We don't think too much about what we're doing, but we'll try anything with complete abandon and and uh, and courage. And sometimes it blows up in our face, and other times it's great. Whereas the French will like over over theorize it. I mean, it's kind of a cliche joke, and it's it's something that I I don't know why. I just I find it amusing. Because uh, some of the greatest explorers were French. I don't want to put them down, right? The, or, or, or Paris UX guys are friends of mine. I love them. They're, they did some of the greatest prank, you know, like underground pranks ever. You know, the you must know about the uh, the, the clock Pantheon clock thing that they did, right? Uh, remind me. Oh my God. Um, well, these these kids were they were sneaking into the uh, catacombs set from the time they were like kids, like 13, 14 year old kids, and they had a crew. And they were really into it, and they were extreme explorers. Like most of the kids going in the catacombs. Have you been in the French? Have you been in the catacombs? Okay. Most of the kids going in the catacombs. A lot of French teenagers go in the catacombs, right? A lot of them. And they go in, and they go in the first. They go into like the, the out, like the, the closest area to the to the to the entry, portal that they go in, and there'll be certain areas that are like completely tagged, and they have disco parties in there. They'll, you know, eat a bunch of mushrooms and go in on Friday night with like 50 kids, and, you know, and rave out. And that's kind of the main thing, but there were certain crews, like the Paris UX, that were just, they were fucking explorers. They'd go in, and they'd go through miles and miles and miles and miles and miles of tunnels, find all the bone rooms, find entryways in the basements of state buildings, you know, find crossovers into different underground systems. I mean, they were really into it. And this crew, the Paris UX crew, was they were extreme. You know, they'd spend like days, months exploring tunnels when they were kids. And they... Uh, Ended up um, doing underground cinema for many years. They were doing it for years. They did it from the time of 15 till they were in their 40s, right? And uh, and and they're all about a little bit younger than me. They're like 10 years younger than me ish. But uh, they were doing it for a long time, and they they got famous because they were doing underground cinema for 15 years. And they finally got busted, and it made international news. I mean, it was in Le Mans, and you know, like uh, 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 Liberation, and fucking Wired, Wired magazine wrote about it. You know, so it's pretty famous. And they and then. A little bit after, around the time they got busted, they were doing a project in the Pantheon, which, if you've been to Paris, you remember, it was a giant dome, huge dome state building, uh, similar to Christopher Wren's dome in, in London, just a massive building. And inside it, got this clock that was put in there probably when they built the building, you know, like 150 years ago or 200 years ago or whatever. And the clock was a giant clock, and it was part of the, part of the structure of the building, and it hadn't worked in 50 years. It just didn't work. So they started sneaking into the basement of the Pantheon. They f they checked this clock out, and they decided they were going to fix it. And they went into the Pantheon. They found they built a shop with a faux finished wall up in the top part of the dome, and just you never know it was there, you know. And they got it. They got a hold of the clockmaker, and they fucking re they spent a year or so, and they rebuilt the clock. They made it work, and they did it all. <laughs> they did it. And uh, when this, it's a city of Paris uh, uh, location, and the, and when it, when it came out, uh, the city government wanted to prosecute them. They were pissed off because it made them look stupid. And also, they were sneaking into the Pantheon. And so they tried to prosecute them, and the general public was like, wait a second, you had this clock here for 50 years and you didn't fix it, and they fixed it for free and it took them a year and you're gonna try to arrest them? No fucking way. So it got shut down. So there's another famous, really famous incident. And so they're my favorite kind of urbex crew, really, I mean, in history, just because that was such a gift. And that's the point of it. That's the heart of the whole thing to me. It's like a, it's like a gift in a way. Doing pranking like that is like a gift. You know, and the, they combine the, the passion of urban exploration along with the idea of urban, of being a urban, good urban citizen and like working on your environment, making it better, right? But they were doing it was illegal what they were doing, but it was not immoral. And there's a huge difference between illegal and immoral. And I, I, I like to point that out. It's like illegal is usually it is often negotiable, right? I mean, do you drive fifty five miles an hour in a fifty five mile an hour speed limit area? Probably not. Um, if you do, you're an anomaly, because most people don't. So every time they don't do that, they're breaking the law. Is that terrible? Well, is it immoral? Probably not, you know. But it is illegal. Um, and so, if you sneak into an abandoned building that's rotting away and you don't burn it down or smash anything, is that terrible? Is that immoral? I mean, not really. You know, I mean, if you, and I, we got extreme with it. I mean, if you go up on a 
giant freeway billboard and alter it to say something else other than what the commercial intent was, but you do it in a way that you don't damage the underlying billboard. Is that criminal or illegal? Yeah, sure it is. Is it immoral? I don't think so, because the billboard's in public space and you can't avoid it, so why shouldn't I be able to put my message on it along with, you know, uh, uh, Apple or, uh, you know, Exxon or whatever? And if you do it in a way that you don't damage the property, there's a gray area there, you know? And so, and if you're, like, doing the SantaCon thing where you got, like, you know, 200 people in Santa suits, right, and you're running around and maybe, you know, breaking curfew or climbing, or doing stuff you're not supposed to do on the street. If you're not trashing things and you're not assaulting people, is that immoral? I mean, I don't think so. Yeah, could you give some background, actually, on your background with SantaCon and, you know, the evolution of it into today? Well, the Suicide Club evolved, or it ended, and it was really sad, uh, but about four years later, a bunch of us had been wanting to start another group, and I wasn't I wasn't there for the first couple of meetings, but we ended up uh, starting a thing called the Cacophony Society, which um, I immediately got involved in. It's kind of a kinder, gentler suicide club. Cacophony Society, we did events, range of events, you know, urban exploring, street theater, uh, LARPing, uh, um, uh, you know, um, midnight walks after doing, you know, literary walks, we'd go walk in the cemetery and read, read from passages that were historically relevant to the place we were at. I mean, it could be anything, like in the Suicide Club. That group, uh, Carrie Galbraith, who was one of the main organizers, had a concept that she called The Zone, and she did a couple of events based on it. Uh, and her idea was taken from, uh, was taken from uh, Andrei Tarkovsky, the Russian filmmaker, who made a film called Stalker. And Stalker is based on a Russian novel by the Strugovsky brothers. And it's a science fiction novel about an area of land that was just sort of like a weird, where physics were different from normal physics in the world. And they never really elaborate exactly what happened to it, but it's, it's intimated that some alien species stopped there with their spaceship or whatever, their dimensional shift, and hung out there for like a period of time, and they left a bunch of garbage and stuff, and then they just blew out. And so when you go into the zone area, literally things change, like time changes, the air changes, you could die, just, you know, you could step on something and just die. Anything could happen in the zone whatsoever, so people typically avoided it. And there's this small, tiny group of people called stalkers who would bring people into the zone because the stalkers have kind of like been exploring inside of it, trying to figure out how to how to not die and how to, and, and you could find things in there. Like you could bring out like like weird metal objects that were incredibly valuable, so you could become rich by going into the zone. So there's a lot of incentive for people to do it, but then also people go in there and never return. And it's not the the, the story's not as drawn out as it's not as specific as I'm stating. I'm kind of extrapolating a little bit on the. Kind of on the on the theme, it's way more amorphous, but but uh, it's a great novel uh, and a, and a great movie, a great great movie and a good novel, and so she had this idea, and so we did zone. Whenever we left San Francisco in a group in a, in a planned event, we, could, we it was a zone trip. Anybody that had an idea, we would do it, right? And I'd always wanted to climb the Hollywood letters, so I said I want to climb the Hollywood letters. So, okay, so we went to the Hollywood letters and climbed them which you could do a lot more easily at that time. Uh, another person said, well, I want to go, I heard there's this neighborhood out by LAX where the planes fly right over you, like literally like 100 feet over you. So we went to that neighborhood and the, the actual houses had been torn down like the year before we were there. So just this abandoned field with like kind of crumbled, you know, like foundation of houses and things. And these planes flying right over us, like seemingly you could touch them. That was pretty cool. Uh, and we went. We climbed it. We climbed the old Bradbury Building, which was partially, not the Bradbury, the, uh, the Million Dollar Movie Building, which is across the street from the Bradbury Building. We wanted to go in the Bradbury Building, which is where they shot scenes for Blade Runner, because it was just a cool place. And the building was closed, and so we couldn't go in it. But across the street was a Million Dollar Movie Building, which is also in the movie Blade Runner. There's a scene in it, and that building was an office building with a giant theater, and uh, the Million Dollar Theater, and uh, and about. 90% of the office building was abandoned. And so we just snuck in the building, went up on the roof, explored all, and we explored these abandoned offices. And the whole event, like for three days, it was like, it was mind boggling. Because we're just in Los Angeles, right? But the way that we looked at what we were doing, it's like, it was a profound experience. Yeah. And really then cool. would you say, um, like something like SantaCon was built out of the idea of zones that you had? No, not really. SantaCon was a similar, I mean, 
Santa Claus, Santa Claus was just an event that Rob Schmidt had the idea for it, and it had been tossed around in the Suicide Club, but we never did it in the Suicide Club. And Rob had the idea, I think, independently uh, in '94, um, and he had, there's several influences on that. But with SantaCon, Rob just he had, it was a very simple idea. There was no deep philosophy behind it. It was like let's. He, he found a place where you could buy like a fifteen dollar Santa suit, you know, Oriental Trading Company, and he listed it as an event in the cacophony newsletter, which is called Rough Draft. That was the name of the newsletter because when we were when we were building it, we couldn't come up with a name for it, so it's just Rough Draft, which ended up being the perfect name for the newsletter. Anyway, he lo loaded it in there, noted it in there as an event. And with the event write-ups, you would you would see what you're supposed to do. And oh, and I never elaborated on this, but it's super important in the Suicide Club, the the, the editorship of the newsletter, as I mentioned earlier, uh, rotated. But so there's it was an anarchist kind of thing. Nobody owned it, but individual events. If you were doing individual events, you could be as fascist as you wanted. You could write down these are exactly what you have to bring on this event. So for my events that were dangerous climbing events, like climbing the Golden Gate Bridge, say, no drugs, no alcohol. You have to wear a certain kind of clothes, bring a flashlight, and you have to agree to stick with the group and follow whatever, you know, and if you can't agree to that, don't come. And so that was the interesting thing about it. So the, you know, you had this like, the, the, uh, the larger container was like free form, completely free concept, anarchist kind of idea, but the individual events could be absolutely militaristic if you wanted, or not. It just, you know, whatever the individual person wanted. So with SantaCon, Rob's idea was just, we, it was very simple. It's like we get dressed up, in Santa suits, we're, we're everybody's Santa, kind of like Soviet socialist realism. Like everybody's exactly the same. Like I am Spartacus. No, I am Spartacus. Right? That whole that was the idea, and I love that idea. It's like okay, that means that we're going to be in a group of a bunch of people, and we're all the same. So we can do anything that we want, and we can't be stopped because nobody knows who's who because everybody's the same. So it gives us an enormous amount of power on the street, an enormous amount of power. But because of our general ideas and philosophy around what we were doing, we weren't gonna, we weren't going to do anything horrible. <laughs> we weren't going to rob a bank. We weren't going to like you know torment people. And so it, was a, it had a very so it, 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 it's hard to explain a lot of these events because they contained a couple of very different concepts. And in one concept, it's like anarchism. It's like people think of anarchy and they think, oh, it means smashing things and blowing things up. Or these people are like they just want to be so free that they 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 want to smash anything that's structured. That's that's not at all what it was about. I mean, we were, I would say we were, we were culturally and maybe socially anarchist leaning. There was no doctrine. Most people in the group wouldn't have even said that we were anarchists at all. I believe that we were because of the, the because of the, the culture that we, that we created out of this collaborative effort where everybody was sort of equal in what we were doing. Um, it created this, and it allowed us the ability to do all kinds of amazing things. So with the SantaCon, you'd see people coming, and in 1994, okay, the meme didn't. A meme took like five years to go around the planet. The what you consider to be a meme now, right? Defined, it would it would take five years for it to get to Bora Bora, right? From New York City or from you know like Barcelona or whatever. Now it takes like five minutes, right? Literally. So back then, your average person, most people, almost no one, had the image of a bunch of Santas in their head. I don't know how to explain it. It's hard to explain now because. Any, it's like, you know, nothing shocking anymore. I mean, I mean, Perry Farrell said that what 30, 30 years ago, twenty five years ago. It's like nothing shocking anymore. But in nineteen ninety four, seeing like thirty five Santas was literally mind gobsmack, mind boggling. People were like, and you can see it in the in the films of the period, and people were literally standing with their jaws hanging open because they never thought of it. It was like, my God, there's like maybe you know a couple of Santas, you know, that working at Macy's or whatever, you know, but it just wasn't in their heads. And so it was genuinely shocking, in a good way. And, and, and so you could take that power that you had and take it any direction you wanted to. And so what we we like, like we do, we were singing Christmas carols. We changed the lyrics to the Christmas carols, um, and we would uh, we'd go through Macy's. And you know, I, there's a lot of things about Santa kind. I don't want to hang on that too much. But you know, we go through Macy's chanting, charge you know, to the to the shoppers, you know, right before Christmas. Charge it, charge it, charge it. Come on, folks, spend all your money here. You know, and just shit like that. And it was any, any idea that we came up with. And we came up with different names, like the, the Chris Kringle Institute, you know, the, the, uh, the, the Crimson Tide. People came, it was the individual creativity that brought into the, to, into the major, into the group. We, we created gifts that we'd wrap and give away to people. Some of the wrapped gifts were a lump of coal, right? And others were like nice little toys or whatever. And, we, and some of them we wrapped in like old, like 1960s Playboys, you know? So it was just this, 
you know, like a riff on the event. And I, I didn't like, personally, I didn't like Christmas because, and not, I'm not saying anybody else in the group would agree with this or, or, or have the same philosophy, but I didn't like Christmas because I realized, by the time I was nine years old and I realized Christmas was bullshit, I realized years later that was the beginning of middle class hypocrisy. That's when you as a child are lied to. It's a major lie. And people say, oh, it's just Christmas, it's just Santa, right? But you're a little kid, and you go, oh, Santa, 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 Santa. And then suddenly you realize Santa's just a phantom, doesn't really exist, and no one fucking talks about it ever again. Okay? That's the core of hypocrisy and the lie. And so I, I hated it. I hated Christmas. You know, it was a time, my family weren't monsters at all. They are basically decent people, but they had their issues and problems, and Christmas time, they tried to make it a happy time. But... You know, and a lot of times it was like family strife would occur, you know, during those holidays. It does for a lot of people. Yeah. Most people commit suicide right around Christmas time. I mean, and it's this, it's this imaginary, illusory lie built on, built on a, uh, uh, like a, a mountain of, of religious and commercial bullshit. Yeah. You've got your Christianity behind it, and then you've got your... Uh, Macy's and Gimbel's commercialism that evolved in the 1850s because those fucking giant shopping uh, shopping uh, 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 businesses in downtown Manhattan had a slow season and they tried to figure out a way to make money during Christmas time and they built Christmas. If you study the history, it wasn't that uh, that specific, but that's what happened. When we were for, for first doing it, we didn't. I mean, there was I always had like a mild sense of like, okay, this is a political prank, because we'd done the billboards with the Billboard Liberation Front. And we always tried to do stuff that was not politically, not obviously political. We wanted to show, with the billboards, we wanted to show that we were, we were, I'm screwing my mustache here, it's sticking up on my nose. But we, yeah, we were trying to show that anyone could, could alter a billboard and make it their own. We weren't trying to make a specific political statement, like fuck Exxon or fuck McDonald's or whatever. That wasn't the point. We were trying to make fun of corporations, but not in a ham-fisted way. We were trying to make fun of corporations in a way that your average working person would look at it and not be offended. So if you had, if you said, fuck Exxon on a billboard, right, your average dude, maid, or policeman, or, you know, like, construction dude would look at it and they would think, wow, vandals, some criminals did that, right? That's immediately what they think. So we wanted to do billboards so they look at it and they, they kind of, it would catch their attention and then they would laugh. And they wouldn't think about it necessarily immediately as a criminal act but then somewhere in the back of their mind, they had to like subconsciously understand that regular people went up on this billboard, this multi-million dollar campaign, and changed it to what they wanted to see. And that's the radical thing. Watching a police officer laugh at our Shit Happens billboard, the Exxon Shit Happens billboard, was one of the crowning moments of my life. Because we did this billboard, said uh, it had been a, it had been a, a radio station billboard, said uh, 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 hits happen, new X100. Because the, the, the colloquial term, shit happens, which is spread around the world, didn't exist before 1988. Nobody said shit happens, literally, you have to take my word for it. It was not a phrase. In 1988, somebody in the media, who knows how, it became a meme, shit happens, and, it, and everybody started saying shit happens, right? So this billboard company, or uh, the radio company on their billboard, did a wordplay their billboard said hits happen the X100. <laughs> so we changed it to what it obviously should say. And this was right after the Exxon Valdez had dumped a shit ton of oil in the uh, Alas in the in the in, you know in the Alaskan wilderness. And so we I happen to have long story short, I happen to have these ten foot red, white, and blue Exxon logos. I had a couple of them, several of them. So we took the logos and we altered these billboards to say shit happens new Exxon. And we did press releases, which we sent out, got a lot of press for it, stating that we supported Exxon, you know, because we thought, we thought there were, we, oil, oil seepage is a natural occurrence, as noted by an Exxon, you know, like, uh, spokesperson. And we supported, uh, we supported uh, uh, oil production because it oil, in addition to running your cars, they created a, a, a tarmac out of it so you could make freeways and make roads. And without roads, there's no billboards. Without billboards, we wouldn't be in business, so we support Exxon. So, we, so you know, we, we wrote all this shit up, sent it out in press releases, and the fucking media printed it like it was true. They knew it wasn't true, but it was funny. And so I learned a lot about media from this stuff, like, like how that shit works. And so with the billboard thing, right, we, we went to great pains to not damage the billboards, and we pretended that we were supportive of the whole industry. So that was really a fun way to approach it. And, uh, and it's genuinely subversive. I sat there on one of the billboards that we had done in downtown San Francisco, the financial district. I watched people walk by it. Every, like, hundredth person noticed it because it's packed background noise. 
everybody that saw it stopped for about 30 seconds, looked at it, and started laughing, including a cop. And I watched that, and I'm like, that made my day. It made my month, because it's like, that's really subversive. When you get somebody who's in a position of, you know, who's a worker, worker bee, who works for the man, or works for the, you know, the, 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 the hierarchy, who actually sees the humor and making fun of this giant mechanism that he's caught up in, that's subversive. Getting some radical person who hates Exxon, who goes, fuck Exxon, who cares, right? You're preaching to the converted, right? And those people are, you know, a lot of them are kind of annoying anyway. You know, the, the extreme political types are just annoying anyway. And they, they, they have contempt for the, your, your basic working people, right? And, and I don't. And so getting somebody like that and, and making them see the machine that they're in for a minute, for a second, I think that's super. Anyway, yeah, so we're I, doing that. So with SantaCon... You know, without putting too much political importance on it, because there wasn't that much, there was a little bit. The idea was like, oh, okay, you get together with your friends and kind of take over the holiday and then make it your own, which is what how I looked at it. So doing SantaCon for me was like taking back this hypocritical holiday. This is the beginning of, you know, like childhood, you know, like middle class hypocrisy or introduction to the lie of your culture, you know, which is like, oh, we don't, you know, we make up these stories and then they're not true and we don't talk about it. Little children are led to believe these things. And yeah... I mean, is it really horrible? Most people would say no. It's just always oh, just Santa Claus, right? But it is really horrible because it's the core of our culture. It's a lie. Yeah. And, and, and then, so I didn't like that. I'm not claiming that anybody else involved in SantaCon would have that same opinion. Most of them probably don't. But that's personally, that's how I felt about it. Right. So taking back the and making our own our own holiday was a grand was a grand thing. We did that through cacophony. You know, yeah. it, was a, it was a mechanism for being able to do that sort of thing. And Rob Schmidt, it's a very simple idea, very powerful. And it resonated in a way that it took off on its own. It became a meme. It took off. By 1998, when we did the New York SantaCon, it was already already happening in five or six cities around the country by people we didn't know. And it just blew up, and it became this giant thing that we had zero control over, which is fine because we, were not about, <laughs> we weren't really about controlling anything. And, and, and I, by 98, I was done. After five years of SantaCon, I'm like, I'm done with that. I'm not doing that anymore because it's getting, getting kind of stupid. But I had a great time. It was really fun. It was awesome. It took off. It became this giant event, and I was annoyed. But by the teens, I was so, like everybody else. I was totally annoyed by all these drunken teenagers. Blah blah blah. It's terrible, terrible, terrible. And then years later, I realized, like, wait a second, right? Largely, the event. It's such. You take a place like New York City. Largely, the event is like teenagers and young twenty-year-old kids coming in from Long Island and you know Jersey and coming to the city. Some of them for the first time. Getting drunk, running around with a bunch of people in an in an unmediated event that's not really controlled by anybody, and yeah, it's a big stupid thing. It's like like uh, St. Patty's Day or whatever, but nobody really controls it. You know, these different companies and businesses have tried to like they'll, they'll rent venues and they'll try to make and they've been making money off of it. But the larger event is not controlled by anybody, right? Santas are all over the place. It's, it's an anarch. It's a genuine anarchist event, and the fact that it's a bunch of eighteen year olds from fucking you know from, uh, you know, like Hollis, Long Island or whatever, is, in, I, I realized years later, it was intensely annoying to the uh, hipsters in, uh, in uh, you know, in the Lower East Side and in, uh, and in uh, you know, in Greenpoint, whatever, and it was really annoying to them. And I started thinking about it, and I thought, that's actually really funny. It's like all these kids are coming in, they're barfing on the street, they're fucking in, in alleyways, and it's pissing off the hipsters, and you know what? That's fucking funny. New York City seemed more piss and vomit and shit hosed off of the streets than you can imagine in your wildest dreams. So if some fucking dude and you know and his, you know girlfriend with a funny haircut, you know, in Williamsburg is, is annoyed that there's a bunch of drunken teenagers in red suits in their favorite bar for one day out of the year, right? And they don't like it, it's like big fucking deal, get over it. You know what I mean? And I love that. And so I, I came around to it again and I realized, okay, well Santa Con is still an annoying event. I would never go on it. But uh, but it's like yeah, it's just the kids. They're doing it. It's still largely unmediated, uh, and they and they're you know and good for them. They should do it. Golden Gate Bridge. Um, the first time that the first time that I climbed it was with Peter Field. It was in 1977, probably like September, July or September. Well, probably September 77, and just the two of us. And we went out and we didn't know what we were doing. And we went out. And we, didn't want, and we knew we didn't want to climb the cables because that's obvious and you'd be caught, right? So we looked at the structure. We went out to Marin Headlands and the box beams, uh, the, the lower cord box beams that come out underneath the, underneath the roadway, you know, they, they intersect with the cable housing back about 200 feet 
300 feet back on the top of this giant uh, mesa, a bluff, like above, like up at the top of these cliffs, right above Lime Point, right above the ocean. And so we looked at it, and uh, you know, this little bluff is about 10 feet below the bottom of these box beams. So we realized that you could just throw a rope over the box beam, and you know, I was like 19, 20 years old at the time. I just turned 20, I think. No, it's actually, it would have been 19. Um, you could just climb up the rope, and then you know, the two of us were both you know young climbers, and so and get up on the box beam, and then walk out on the box beam to the tower, right? And then you're at the tower, and then maybe you could figure out some way to climb up from there. We didn't know, we had no idea, and so we did that. So we went out there, we had like a 20 foot rope, 30 foot rope. We tossed it over the box beam, climbed up on the box beam, climbed out over these you know on a, on a two foot, two and a half foot wide box beam over 200 feet down to gravel because you know the the, the Marin Tower is right on the edge of the land. And uh, we got out there, and we got on these catwalks. And the, the walkways, pedestrian walkways, go out of the roadway, and they go around the tower like that. And we got out under this apron of the uh, walkway, and we're sitting underneath the sidewalk, you know, 260 feet, 240 feet above the water and the and the ground, sitting on this catwalk, and we talked for about four hours. And it was, we became really good friends right at that moment, the two of us, because we didn't really know each other that well. Honestly, climbing it was kind of like a macho thing because we're young guys like, hey, we're climbing the bridge. Yeah, I can do that, you know. Like, and so we did it, and then we sat there. And so he and I became lifelong friends. I still know him. I've known him for 46 years. You know, he's a historian now. He wrote a book about the Tenderloin, and he's a pretty smart, great guy. You know, an old friend. And uh, and we thought this is awesome. And then we started looking around, and we realized. And then I climbed, uh, then Gary Warren did an event. He did a uh, he did the first Suicide Club event where it was posted in a newsletter of climbing the Oakland Bay Bridge, and that was in. Uh, September of 77 and uh, we did that event and we got these uh, little rafts and we, were, we climbed the cantilever span which is on the east side of the uh, of the of uh, Yerba Buena Island and we rafted out we snuck through an, uh, an active military base right snuck through it wasn't you know it was kind of de not decommissioned but it was like you know like at the end of its string it wasn't wasn't like they had nuclear weapons or anything, right? So it was kind of low, lower security. But we snuck through an active secure uh, naval base down to the water, carried these like fold up, blow up boats, blew these boats up, uh, two of them, and then we rafted out to the base of the uh, cantilever span uh, 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 stanchions and climbed up the bridge. You know, and what was what was your reaction after climbing the bridge? Like, what how did what? you how did you react? How did you feel? Oh, it was okay. fabulous. I had been looking at bridges for a while, even before I joined the Suicide Club, before that whole thing started. I had been looking at climbing things. I was climbing buildings in San Francisco. Uh, I'd climb statues and stuff like that, because I just like to climb things. And so I was out mostly by myself, because um, I didn't really have any, any fellows. Um, that's why running into the Suicide Club was so was brilliant. Was it, I couldn't, let me put it this way. I, I wanted to be an adventurer. I wanted to have an exciting life. I could have been an Amazonian explorer. I could have been an astronaut. I could have been any of those things. Um, maybe I could, maybe I could, you know, I could have pursued those, and it wouldn't have been as good as what I did. I found exactly the right thing for me. I was like one of the luckiest people in the world. I fell right into what I should be doing. Most people don't get that. Some people do, but it's like I literally fell into exactly what I should be doing, and that was a suicide club. And so, uh, what was the question? <laughs> oh, uh, I guess just your reaction, but... <laughs> oh, it was amazing. Are you kidding? It was like... It was like climbing Everest, you know. I mean, near, clearly it's not as intense or as much of a much of a you know heroic effort, but it was like that. It was like we figured it out. And the thing is, it wasn't like with the suicide club. It wasn't like a macho competitive thing. It was like a collaborative thing. We all did it together. And so I was a really good climber, like a natural climber. A lot of people weren't, and I would always me, Pierre Barral, Jim Mashowski, some other people who were good climbers would always help people who couldn't climb as well. Most of the people were young, fit people, so, you know, climbing the bridge is not like climbing Everest, right? You're not, like, face climbing rocks. There's ladders, there's, you know, it, it, you know, it's built so that your average working smoke can climb it, you know, like I can climb, you know, like an old guy. So, it's scary, though, because you're going up 740 feet, you know, and uh, you're inside the tower for part of it, but then you're outside, you know, up on the top, and so, but it was a, it was a collaborative thing. It was, a, it was, we're all in it together, you know, it's like... Yeah. Later, years later, the movie uh, Brazil came out, and the character Harry Tuttle, which is a Robert De Niro character in that movie, he nails it. He's it, it, exactly that was a, one of the romantic, fictional expressions of what I, what I've been involved in, and what I do, and what me and my 
associates have been involved in, which is where, you know, he get, you know, he's, he's out there, he's like a gorilla fucking, he's a gorilla, you know, HVAC repairman. He's sneaking in, cutting through all the government bullshit, completely illegally making things work, making, fixing things, like, making things work and contributing to society very positively, but it's, what he's doing is illegal and not sanctioned by the control, by the government, because they don't want people to have, they don't want individuals to have agency. They don't want people to collaborate together. They don't want people to create their own lives. They don't want people to, they don't want people to be creative and powerful. They want it, they want you to be a fucking consumer. They want you to do what you're supposed to do, be in your little cubicle, you know, and the fight club's about that, you know, 100%. And uh, Brazil was about that. You know, the greatest, you know, to me, the greatest fictional representations of humanity are about that core, that core spirit. Individuals, you want to come together with other people in a real, genuine, powerful and loving collaboration to make your own reality. That's what, that's the ultimate goal of humanity. And the people who control things don't want that. They don't want you to do that because it doesn't benefit them in their own like evil top-down hierarchy. Against hierarchies, 100%. Burning right. Man became a fucking hierarchy, became something that's the antithesis of what it, of what it was. It became something, it's a great party, it's still got value, but it became the antithesis of what it was. But how did you feel like the vibe uh, changed after 9-11 towards a lot of this stuff? Interesting, very good, um, very good question. Um, I thought, well, we did, we were doing an event in New York City, like, about a week after 9-11. It had been planned for a couple months. It was uh, Julia Solis and her newly formed group, uh, been out for a couple of years, Dark Passage, doing a lot of intense underground exploration stuff. And we, she had an event planned to go into um, the Croton Aqueduct over the uh, Washington High Bridge, 181st, uh, uh, you know, over the, you've probably been in it. I would, and so we did, and, and it was planned for, you know, like, September 25th or something like that. Anyway, I was, we were going to be in New York, so I went, you know, we, well, we're still going to do it. And she's like, yeah, I think so. So we went there, and we debated doing it or not doing it. We went up and checked out the site. Uh, New York City at that time was like somebody had shot a fucking wasp nest with a fucking 12-gauge shotgun. There were helicopters flying all over the place, people, cops everywhere. People were like... Flipped the fuck out. As you probably remember, you're old enough to probably remember 9-11, maybe. But it was fucking flipped out. And so we were like, oh, should we do this? I mean, we get caught, we're really going to be in trouble. And we decided to go ahead and do it. And we did. And we, I remember, I'll remember, we were on the Manhattan side up in that park, I forget the name of the park, right above the, the bridge, getting ready to, like, climb down this embankment and get on the, and get on the top of the bridge. And then we were going to, she had found a way in on the, on the, uh, uh, on the Bronx, Bronx side. Yeah. And we were going to go over there, and, and so we had to walk across the top of the bridge. We were kind of visible, and uh, and we did it. We got across. We got in the hole that they had found, and we got inside the. Uh, and and it hadn't been hardly anybody had been inside this interior chamber, and I know that because when we got into it, we got into the nine foot diameter, eight foot, nine foot diameter pipe that runs through the top of the thing, and as we were walking through it. As we were walking through it, there hadn't been water in it in decades, right? As we were walking through it, whole sheets of rust, like as much as like six, eight, ten feet wide, would like you'd bump into them and they like shatter into dust. You know what I, you know what I mean? It's like somebody who hasn't been in a place like this, it's hard to explain. Yeah, it's, and it's just we it knew as we were going through it that nobody had been in there in like fucking thirty years, forty years, like nobody, because if they had, they would have fucked. You know what I mean? And the whole place was like, it was really bizarre. There's a scene in the movie Roma, the Fellini film Roma, which you should watch, which is very reminiscent of that. Um, I don't know if you know Fellini or if you've watched any of his movies or anything, but... What else has he made? Satyricon. He's an Italian filmmaker, one of the greatest filmmakers in history. Mm -hmm. I'd highly recommend watching his movie Roma. Roma is, is a... It's a documentary, but it's also a lot of it's made up. A lot of it's recreated. And you can't tend to... Fellini was a genius, and so... You kind of can't tell when you're going from an actual documentary scene that's actual real life stuff and into something that he completely created. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to know. It's really confusing. And so there's a scene where he's, they're interviewing these uh, I uh, I R Italian Roman engineers. They work for the, you know, the city of Rome's you know, Department of Public Works. And they're the real guys. They're actual engineers. And they're talking about digging the subway. They're building a new subway you know, t tunnels in Rome. And going into one of these chambers, right? And it's an underground chamber. It's been sealed for like 2,000 years. 
and they break it open into it and they go into it and as they go into it there are these like colorful multicolorful uh, uh, bas relief friezes you know like on the wall like multicolored giant images of like Caesar and you know the, the, the whatever and as they're going into it they the oxygen because it, the chamber's been closed for like 2,000 years the oxygen and the nitrogen everything coming in the 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 the, the, the giant murals start ble uh, start bleaching out it, right mm -hmm. in your very eyes and you're watching it, like fucking freaking out because oh my god look at this look what's happening here and later you realize that they that probably did happen but they made it up it wasn't real it was a, right. it was a fix. and you kind of experienced yeah. that firsthand did you feel like because you went there right after 911 everything was a lot more tense as far as oh, it was intense as fuck i mean it was like the air was on the air was a, it was like it was like the air was filled with ozone i don't know how to explain it like we were literally it was one of the most alive I've ever felt in my life because we knew it was risky what we were doing and stupid you know because like we probably shouldn't do this because it's like right after 9-11 and it, if they catch us we're going to be you know we're going to have a hard time getting out of this yeah. in the suicide club in the 70s finding a person finding a really good weirdo was really hard was really hard to find somebody who was into the stuff that you were into so when you ran across somebody and our drawing group our pool of people that, that, that to recruit for the suicide club was from a mailing list of about 3,000 people for a free school. So there was a, that was a pretty big mailing list. And so out of 3,000 people that got the mailers, maybe it ended up that 100 of them were interested in the suicide club. That's how many. And, it, and that was out of a 3,000 person mailing list. So we had a, at the height of the suicide club, we had about 100 people on our, on our mailing list. And so if you run into somebody who's a real weirdo in your own vein, who you immediately hit it off with, that's rare, right? Social media, the good part of social media is it's not rare anymore. If you want to find somebody who's interested in trans you know, the land speed of trans swallows or something, something really obscure, you can immediately find a hundred people around the world who are really into that. Boom, just like that. You can look at it and do it on your phone right now. That's a miracle. To find people who you have a genuine shared interest with, an obscure interest that most people could give a fuck about, that's a, that's a gift. That's an amazing thing. And it's very powerful, and it's a good thing. On the balance, it's a good thing. There are certain things about it that are, you know, problematic, but but on the balance, it's a really good thing. So that's the good part of the social media. The bad part is that it makes certain incredibly, formerly incredibly ephemeral and 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 rare things common. Okay, in a in a way, and so the appreciation for the rareness of a of an event, or the rareness of an exchange, or the rareness of the 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 uh, this ineffable quality of an experience it becomes it kind it kind of banalite how would be the word how makes it banal um, and uh, and 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 that's the sad thing because the, some of the magic kind of leaves some of the magic leaves the 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 experience kind of like air coming out of a tire or something with that said the actual experiences particularly in urban exploration, are so powerful and valuable that the people, there's a certain contingent of people who would do it no matter what. They'd be doing it whether, you know, they got attention for it or not. They'd be doing it whether anybody knew about it or anybody else cared about it or not. And that's the smaller group of people that I want to hang out with. The people, they do it because they love it. Urban exploration, is, it's a worldwide phenomenon. Everybody's, like I said, everybody's done it. I did it when I was six, right? Everybody, everybody nine out of ten people, when they were a kid, they snuck into the tunnel down at the end of the street, or they went into the ghost house that was abandoned, you know, or they went into the abandoned barn and had a beer, you know, drank beer with their friends on their team. Everybody's done their urban exploring, right? Everybody's done it. Sneak into the cemetery at night, you know, uh, all of that. So climb on a rooftop and, you know, smoke a joint with your friends or whatever. That's urban exploring. Everybody's done it. But the people who are really fanatic about it and it's their lives, I mean, that's a smaller contingent of people. But it's a worldwide phenomenon now, and as any other like major worldwide phenomenon that has a, an entire culture that emanates from that phenomenon, there's a whole spectrum, and the spectrum goes from like the total like lockdown, controlled, never fucking print a photo ninja types who like want to go to the most extreme abandoned places ever and don't talk about it except to people they know. It goes from there to the 15-year-old Instagram kids who it, it's become a cultural thing for them to want to go and take a picture of themselves, selfie of themselves, hanging off of a radio tower from their fingernails. So that's the whole spectrum. And it's everybody in between, right? So the, and, and it's everybody in between. The culture of extreme, or, or of like, the culture of urban exploration has, because of some of 
preceding groups and preceding preceding social and cultural uh, 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 groups and histories, it has a bunch of like kind of vague, mostly unspoken tenets. One of them is like, for the extreme explorers, is don't fucking burn locations. It's real simple. It's like, you know, you go to a location, it's really cool, you don't want people to kind of the idiots on the one end of the spectrum. It's God bless them, they're kids, they don't know any better, right? But you don't want the selfie kids coming in and trashing the place and blowing it up. You don't want them, so you try to keep a lid on it. So part of the culture is a culture of, uh, of, of respect and, and, uh, and uh, uh, conservation, right? We don't want to trash it, we want to have them as long as we can. You go into an abandoned, insane asylum that takes up like fucking 30 acres, right? It's got tunnels underneath it, it's got towers, and it's got bell towers, it's got theaters, it's got, you know, it's an amazing complex. It's been abandoned for 20 years, right? It's astonishing. The aesthetic of the place is, to, to most people, it'd be, you know, who cares, right? But to the people who are in the urban exploration, it can be like almost like a transcendental experience, like exploring a place like that, as I think you know. So you want to, you don't want to ruin that. You don't want to be the person that fucks that up, right? So you kind of keep a lid on it as much as you can. You don't talk about it. It's only through, through really, you know, like a, a really a dedicated explorers. But over time, people find out about it. It gets blown up, and then usually, most of the cases get blown up. Idiots come in. There's a whole contingent of people who come in and like smash things or steal things or don't care or put photos wherever, and uh, and so you got that whole spectrum, of, you know, of. Uh, of, of types of explorers because there's hundreds of thousands of people that do it you know it's not just you and me but but the culture of extreme exploring is a real culture and and it has these tenets and and people who don't adhere to the tenets are cast out of the culture and if it's their if it's their life that they don't want to do that there's a lot of social pressure not to be a dick Burning Man as it, as it exists now is a giant Really colorful uh, party for you know middle class and rich white people. That's basically what it is. That's the, that's the core of it. It's a much bigger entity than simply that. But that's the that's the core of it. It's a it's a sanctioned vacation for Silicon Valley professionals. That's what it is. It costs if you're going to go to Burning Man and have a Burning Man experience, it's going to cost you three grand, basically from the beginning to the end. Okay, your average working person can't. It's like they'd rather go to Cancun, you know, if they're gonna if they're gonna spend that much money. Um, is that a bad thing? No, no, it's a great party, you know. Uh, the Burning Man organization spends some small portion of the sixty or eighty million dollars that they make for throwing a fucking week long party. They spend a small portion of that money uh, supporting some artist, and like any art grants council. That's a good thing. Giving money to artists and letting them do their art is a really good thing. Can't criticize it really. Like most hierarchical situations, the the, the, the grant process at Burning Man is a, is a kiss ass thing. It's people who do you know and who's asked you kiss to some degree. It's being it's being connected, but it's still not a bad thing. You know, uh, on the balance, uh, and Burning Man spends less money uh, for their budget on supporting artists and a lot of other like more established grant, grant councils do, which is to their to their shame. Uh, they should spend a lot more money on that, but they don't. Um, it's become a top-down hierarchy. Uh, it, it started, Burning Man started, it was a cacophony event on the desert. It was literally his own trip to the desert. It was uh, his own trip number four. The first, uh, the first Burning Man on the Black Rock Desert in 1990 was a cacophony society. Uh, his own trip number four, Bad Day at Black Rock, that's what we called it. And uh, probably to about 93, I'd say Burning Man was basically a large cacophony event. It got bigger every year. It happened, and it grew at the same time as the birth of the Internet, and it became, the, and it, by 95, 96, it had become the, uh, a, 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 a sanctioned vacation for Silicon Valley professional workers. It was starting to become that by the time I left in 96. And, uh, you know, as an event, it was a free-form Anarchist event. Anybody could do whatever they wanted to. There were very few. There were actually no rules in the beginning because people were expected not to be dicks and typically weren't. Uh, the acculturation, which had come from the Suicide Club, the whole leave no trace thing. That Burning Man was from the Suicide Club. The idea of collaboration and gift, gifting or whatever, sharing your shit with other people. They didn't invent any of that. You know, the whole ten principles that my ex-partner Larry Harvey came up with. It's like 
he went to the fucking burning bush and God decreed that, you know, it's just bullshit. The guy was a, he was a grifter, you know, I mean, in a windbag um, who jumped in front of a parade with a flag. That was, uh, that was you know, and, and that's what that was. Um, but it's a great party and it grew up at the same time with the internet and uh, so people love it. They have a great, they go there and they have a great time. It's like all giant festivals like that that have happened throughout history it is a safety valve for the control factor of the society that you live in. So our corporate control, down hierarchical, uh, gradually uh, devolving corporate oligarchic uh, 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 fascist state that we live in, okay, Burning Man is an official function of that state. It's the party that you, you can officially go to, and you know you spend your 50, 52, 51 weeks out of the year in your cubicle slaving away for Google or whomever, right? And that one week, you sanctioned, you can go to Burning Man, you can fucking do a bunch of drugs, get naked, paint yourself blue, fuck somebody that you just found, and run around and see all this cool art and shit blowing up in blinky lights. It's a great party, and that's not a bad thing. But it serves a, it serves a, it serves a, a, a you know, like a, it's a mechanism, in a way, and uh, and it's a, it's a mechanism. It's become part of the, it's become part of the, uh, what are we going to call it? The, uh, uh, the man, you know, the, the society, the, uh, uh, the control factor that wants us to be cogs in a wheel. You know, Burning Man's part of that. It's like uh, the illusion uh, uh, rights going back to ancient Greek times. That's what that was. That's where you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the giant festivals in, in Europe in the Middle Ages. You could make fun. You could get drunk, bomb it on everything, run around for a week, do whatever you wanted to, make fun of the king, and get away with it, and then back to being a slave the rest of the year. That's what Burning Man is now. It, it's a it's a safety valve, and it, taking it in and of itself, it's a great thing. It's a wonderful event. A great, amazing shit, shit blowing up, cool art. People get together, see their friends, they haven't seen them in maybe a year. It's like a convention for weirdos to some degree. You know, it's a big event, so it inco incorporates a lot of stuff. Um, and on the balance, it's not a bad thing, but it is, realizing what it is, it's the antithesis of what it was originally, which was a genuinely free, totally anarchist expression of human collaboration and creativity. That's what it was. And I don't live in the past, and I realize things change, and that's great. Urban exploration as a worldwide field, you can't monetize it. It's impossible to monetize it. Yeah, you can make a book and sell your book, you can sell your photos or whatever, but you cannot do an event, take people into abandoned, dangerous places, and do it as a business. Because to do it as a business, you have to have insurance, you have to have a certain surety that people are not going to be injured, and the first time some rich guy stubs his toe after paying a thousand dollars to go into an abandoned building, your business is over. Done. One of the reasons I love urban exploration, on top of the aesthetic value and just joy of going into these amazing environments, you can't make a fucking business out of it. And that's a miracle. Because, man, in our fucking culture, we want to make a buck on everything we do. We want to monetize everything we do. And it take, it just it, it cheapens and it, t t it makes it into something that it's no longer a genuine expression of, of human joy and love and collaboration. It's fucking, it's a business. And somebody's making money on it. Somebody's controlling it. Somebody's driving how it's going to evolve. And I rail against that. You know, I, I get it. You, know, you got to have. I'm not against business. I have a business, small business, right? I'm not against business, but some part of your life has to be not commercially controlled. It has to be uncommercial. Has to be play. It has to be genuine, free, non-monetized play and, and exploration. And if it's not, you're not living a very good life.